You are watching DHTV from California State University, Dominguez Hills. Hi, I'm Dr. Pamela Kreiser, and welcome back to NCR 525, which is our course in mediation. Now, today we're going to continue talking about the stages of mediation. And we've already talked about stage one in our last episode. So today we're going to begin talking about stage two. Now, stage two is storytelling and issue identification. And this is a very important stage because it's the stage where the mediator starts to understand the issues. And so sometimes mediators can see those issues very easily, and sometimes they're very hard to find. Now, today in our episode, we're going to talk about five different topics. We'll talk about asking questions, perspective taking, paraphrasing, neutral phrasing, and we'll also cover a little bit about positions and interests. And as we explore all of those different ideas, it will set the groundwork for what we need to do in stage two. Because as mediators, it's very simple. We've got to figure out the issues. And sometimes even the parties don't know what those issues are. Now, the first thing we need to talk about is, of course, asking questions. And this is the most important skill of the mediator to, or tool of the mediator to use in terms of getting information. Now, this may seem very obvious to you. Um, sometimes I get the question, what is the most important tool that a mediator has? And the answer is, it's the question because the question has the most flexibility. I like to think of it as duct tape. So if you think about duct tape and you think about how duct tape's used, you can use duct tape to mend a notebook. You can do it, you can put a car mirror back on with duct tape. You can fix a door. You can even um, put two pieces of paper together with duct tape if you wanted to. You can use duct tape for all kinds of things. And so as a mediator, your most important tool is the question. Now, as we think about questions though, we have to examine how to structure them well so that we can figure out what the issues are efficiently. So let's take a look at this first clip that talks about questions. Voltaire said, judge a man by his questions rather than his answers. And he makes a very good point. It's often said that the quality of your life is defined by the questions you ask, because the quality of the question determines the quality of the answer. So it stands to reason that if you can get better at asking questions, then you can get better answers. Better answers result in a whole host of benefits. For example, being better informed allows you to make better decisions. But being better at answering questions doesn't just mean getting better answers. Obtaining information is just one outcome of questioning. Questions can be used for controlling a conversation. This can be particularly useful during an argument or negotiation. Questions can also be used as a way of showing interest. Showing an interest in other people can help to build relationships and showing an interest in a subject can open up opportunities to become involved. What's more, questions can be used to explore people's personalities or to diagnose problems as well as being the common way of testing people's knowledge, such as exam questions. Questions can also be used to encourage further thought or used to emphasize a point. For example, this can be done using a rhetorical question. Finally, ever heard of an icebreaker? Well, questions can be used to encourage a discussion amongst a group and promote conversation amongst people who don't know each other. So it's worth considering how skilled you are at asking questions, because although we all know how to ask a question, do we all know how to do it properly? Questions in their simplest form can either be open or closed. Closed questions are questions which require a short answer, often one word, and chosen from a limited set of possible answers. For example, yes or no questions, or multiple choice questions, or a question to get a specific piece of information. Let's look at some examples of closed questions. Would you like an ice cream? What flavour would you like? How much does it cost? In contrast, open questions allow for much longer responses and therefore potentially more creativity and information. An open question asks the respondent for his or her knowledge, opinion or feelings about something and the response is usually more qualitative than quantitative. They usually begin with what, why or how, but tell me and describe can also be used in the same way. Here are some examples of open questions. Tell me what happened when your ice cream was stolen. Why did you not report it right away? How was your day out at the seaside? There are a few advanced questioning techniques such as leading questions, probing questions, funneling and rhetorical questions. Let's now take a look at how they work. Simply put, leading questions are where you lead the respondent towards giving you a particular answer which is more favourable to you. 
For example, if a salesperson asks you, how many widgets do you want? Then the salesperson has assumed you want some. To answer the question with a number means you've been led to an outcome. However, you must use leading questions with caution because they can be interpreted as rude and manipulative. Probing questions are questions which force the respondent to think more deeply about the information they recall for their answer. For example, if you use a word like exactly in the question, it forces the respondent to be specific. Funneling questions allow you to cleverly funnel the respondent's answers. You do this by asking a series of questions that become more or less restrictive at each step. You start with open questions and end using closed questions or vice versa. For example, have you been to any good parties recently? What did you do at the party? Was any food provided? Did you eat jelly? The questions in the example become more restrictive, starting with open questions which allow very broad answers and at each step the questions become more focused and the answers become more restrictive. Rhetorical questions are often characterized by being questions which do not require an answer. Sometimes the question is unanswerable, but usually the answer is obvious. So obvious, in fact, that you wouldn't answer it. It has been asked to demonstrate a point and said for effect. OK. Do you want to know a secret skill about questioning that is left out of many courses? It's the importance of silence. When you ask a question, no matter how awkward you feel, try to be quiet and let the other person answer. As we've just discussed, unless you're asking a rhetorical question, the purpose of a question is to receive an answer. So be sure to give the respondent the time to answer. And while we are talking about responses, how you interpret the response is equally important to the question. For example, you could ask the best question in the world, but if the answer is a lie or you don't get an answer, what good was the question? Watch out for respondents who only partially answer your questions or stall when responding. Politicians are well known for avoiding the question by giving an unrelated answer. So consider what type of response you are expecting and have a suitable method for making a record of the answer. Now, as you saw in the scenario, there's two examples. The first one was a broad, tell me why we're here today. And this is used by a lot of mediators when we start mediation, especially when we don't know information, because we're not sure what we're up against. It could be a very simple mediation. It could be a very complicated one. Tell me why we're here today. Well, I'm dating her ex-boyfriend, and I think she's been a little jealous, so she's been stalking me. Explain your situation in about five to six sentences. There's so much, but um, she's been following my kids, and they can't even go to school without me feeling that they're safe. Um, she sends me pictures of them. She tells me what they're wearing every day. And I, it's just, it's been a very stressful situation where I fear for my kids' lives. Now, sometimes in the second example, you'll see the mediator will limit the scope a little bit. So you saw the mediator say, tell me in five or six sentences why we're here today. The idea is that you're providing the uh, disputant with a set of expectations that tells them what kind of range we're expecting to hear. Now, of course, we know that disputants don't always do what we ask but we can try to guide them as best we can. Now you notice from that uh, example or that scenario that that's how we start mediation. And I would recommend something pretty simple like that in order to get the ball rolling. Now once we get that ball rolling, one thing that I recommend fairly early in mediation is the use of a demographic question sequence. Now as we think about demographic sequences, I want you to think about what that is. When we're asking for demographics, we're asking for basic factual information. Why would we do this? We would do it so that we can figure out the context that we're dealing with. So as you're thinking about uh, mediating a person who you don't know, you're, there's so much about the context that you don't understand. And so I would recommend most mediators use a set of demographic questions in order to get kind of a handle on the context that we're talking about. So this next scenario shows the use of a demographic sequence. Let's take a look. Let me gather some more information. Do you have a lease agreement? Currently, yes, we do, but her name's not on it. Did you bring it to the session today? I did not. No, I didn't really think it would be relevant since she's not on it. Describe the living arrangement. 
Well, we're roommates. Um, I mean, there's two bedrooms. I have my own room and she has her own room. And then the rest is just common space. How long have you been living together? Uh, I think like four years. As you develop your skills in question asking, of course you're going to have to think about some of the things that you shouldn't do in mediation. One of the main things that mediators shouldn't do is ask leading questions. Now, leading questions are dangerous because they lead the parties, like their title, to a certain type of response by, by the, how the question is phrased. And so as we think about that, we want to avoid leading questions. Now, this next clip is Tracy Goodwin explaining the dangers of leading questions. All right, I want to talk to you now about actually when you ask, the questions to the person you're interviewing. We've already established that we'd rather have some open-ended questions so that the answers can be, uh, you know, discussion can come out of the answers rather than just yes or no. But something that's real important is what we call neutral phrasing. And neutral phrasing is asking the question in such a way that I do not sense your view on it. Like, I'm going to go back to my question about Iraq. Uh, closed would have been, uh, sh uh, should we pull the troops out of Iraq, yes or no? And then we had, do you think we should pull the troops uh, out of Iraq? Or uh, what do you feel about pulling the troops out of Iraq? Well, that's neutral phrasing. What you don't want to do is say something like, don't you think we should pull the troops out of Iraq? because what that's doing is leading. You've heard of leading the witness? All right, that means you're trying to get a certain answer out of your expert, and you don't wanna do that. You don't want to lead them so that you get the answers that you want. Allow them to be the expert and answer the questions that you ask expertly. You'll have a better interview that way. As you can see from the clip from Tracy Goodwin, the leading question is pretty dangerous for the mediator. Here's how I like to think of it. You are not shaping the narratives of your disputants. You are actually trying to understand their narrative. And so as you think about your questioning, make sure that you are just filling in what they're telling you, but not trying to shape what that narrative looks like. Now the second topic for our show today is perspective taking. And this is something that is an area mediators strongly need to consider. This idea that there are other perspectives that individuals have of a given conflict. Um, sometimes I tell mediators, we're not looking for the truth, we're looking for their truth. Meaning that as we're narrating the mediation, as we're talking through the issues, we're trying to understand the varying perspectives. Now sometimes that means that we'll ask parties to take the perspective of the other party. And to think about this concept, I want to show you one of my very favorite clips from Daniel Pink um, called Perspective Taking. I'm gonna give you three very simple instructions. Instruction number one, identify your dominant hand. Instruction number two, with your dominant hand, snap your fingers five times very quickly. Awesome. Instruction number three, with the forefinger, of your dominant hand, the pointer finger of your dominant hand, on your forehead, draw for me a capital E. Excellent. This is an experimental technique that social psychologists have used since the early 1980s to measure what's called perspective taking. The ability to get out of your own head and see things from someone else's point of view. Snap your fingers five times quickly. What's that instruction about? Nothing. <laughs> it's just a distraction. Finally, you get to the part that the researchers really are looking for, which is this. There are two different ways to draw the E. All right, I can draw it like this. So you can see it, your perspective, or I can draw it like this. So I can see it, my perspective. Put people into an experimental setting. Control for handedness. Make them snap their fingers. Ask them to draw an E. What do they do? Do they take their own perspective? Or do they take someone else's perspective? If you drew the E from your own perspective, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. Because what really matters here is context. In general, 
The more powerful people feel, the more their perspective taking abilities degrade. All of you are about to become more powerful. Some of you will begin drawing the E differently than you drew it today. If you gradually lose the ability to see the world through another's eyes, all the experience and expertise you've accumulated will melt into a puddle of unrealized potential. But if you work to balance power and perspective taking, you'll become a more effective leader because you'll offer reasons beyond I said so for why anybody should follow you. You will avoid what could be the biggest mistake that bosses, teachers, executives, government officials, and anyone else in a position of power can make. And the mistake is this, thinking you're the smartest person in the room. If you think you're the smartest person in the room, you've just proved that you're not. Believing that you're the smartest person in the room, trust me on this, never ends well. Remember the lesson of the E. Argue like you're right, but listen like you're wrong. Use your power, but sharpen your perspective taking. I love that clip from Daniel Pink because I love the idea that we have to be open to the fact that we're not the smartest people in the room. That you and I have to take that position as mediators and try to explore the narratives that we're hearing and understand that our position is really a blank slate. We're there to learn. And as we learn, we're able to figure out the issues and help those disputants get to a better place. Now, the third topic we're going to talk about today is paraphrasing. And this is where we take what is said in mediation and we restate it in a new set of words and give it back to the disputants, demonstrating our understanding. Now, remember, this is different from parroting. So you know the concept of a parrot like a bird? And remember, the parrot just repeats. So if you're just repeating as a mediator, you're not actually doing paraphrasing. Now, as you paraphrase, you'll get through to the issues. Even um, as you discover them, you'll be able to verify back to the parties what they are talking about. So let's take a look at this next scenario where paraphrasing is demonstrated. It was just right before the accident. I think seconds before the cars were going to collide, I just froze and I feared that something, you know, that I wasn't going to wake up from it. So what you're telling me is when your cars collided, you were afraid that you would be injured. Okay. So can you describe how you were feeling at the accident? I don't know. Uh, there's just a lot of things that kind of came about. There's a lot of things I think we have to talk about. But um, I think what it really comes down to is, you know, how we communicated and then also like what we're going to do about our cars. Okay. So it sounds like we have two issues here. The issue with the car and the communication during the accident. As you can see, the mediator is prepping the list of agenda items that will be talked about in the mediation. Now, this is something, of course, that we do in stage three, but the mediator is sifting through the details in order to figure out what the issues are. And you can hear that in those paraphrasing examples. As we paraphrase, we get uh, a clearer and clearer look at the issues at hand. Now, of course, we want to talk about our fourth topic today, which is being neutral in terms of our phrasing. Now, you and I as mediators need to be neutral because we can't risk leading parties, as we've already talked about, to a certain direction or perspective. We want to stay neutral so that we're open to the information. As I said, like a blank canvas, like something that is so open that we just don't know how it's going to go. Sometimes even in mediation, I'm surprised where parties go with um, different sequences of questioning. But because I've trained myself to be very neutral, I'm able to go in those places with those people. So maybe think about it that way. Like they're taking you on a journey and you have no expectation about where that journey goes. You're careful with your phrasing. Overall, it's good to do neutral phrasing too because it helps them do the work. Now this is a phrase that you'll hear me talk about a lot. When you're a mediator, you are facilitating the work that the parties have failed to do. And what are you doing? You're having them do that work now in the mediation session. So the funny misconception about mediation is that individuals believe the mediator is doing the work for them. But that's not actually what's happening. It's through neutral phrasing that the mediator is able to conduct or facilitate the work to be redone by those uh, disputing parties who failed to do it prior to coming to the session. 
Now the last uh, topic that we want to talk about is this idea of probing under the idea of neutral questions. And this is the idea that we use probing to get additional information. Now this next scenario I want to show you shows the use of grabbing a single word in order to get more information in a neutral way. Let's take a look. What's been going on between you two? I don't know where to begin. There's just so many issues. Issues? Yeah, I, one thing is that her dog just keeps on barking. I can't go to sleep barking all night. Tell me what's been going on. Well, there's just no privacy between us. Privacy? Like, she brought up the dog. So she can't look over my fence to tell my dog not to bark. That's invading my privacy. As you can see, the mediator took single words in order to try to get the parties to elaborate. And it, I find that it usually works in mediation. So you can see pulling out a single word and asking it in a questioning kind of way is a strategy that you can use to get more information. Notice it's also a neutral strategy in that it asks for the information without having any other attachment to it. And so I would recommend that you think about listening to what your disputants say, selecting key words as a way to pursue the rest of the story. Now the last topic we're going to talk about for the content of the show today is the idea of positions and interests. And we bring this up in stage two because you want to start listening to your disputants from that framework. Now we know that positions are decisions or sides or demands. Sometimes they're presented as non-negotiable areas. Um, and then we know interests are underlying needs. Now what we need to do in stage two is try to figure out what those under underlying needs are. So as you're mediating stage two, you're constantly listening for what the underlying need is. Now one example I like to give um, is regarding our youngest son. And our youngest son um, one time had a, a curfew of midnight and he was going to the movies with some friends. And so I took the position of saying, be home by midnight. That's my rule, that's my decision. And I even said to him, it's non-negotiable. But he was smarter than me in the interaction. Because what he did is he talked about the underlying interest. He turned to me and said, Mom, I absolutely hear you saying that the midnight curfew is non-negotiable. But to be fair, the movie gets out at quarter to 12, and I would have to drive at an unsafe speed to make, make it home for that curfew. And so you know that both of us really want me to be safe. What was my youngest son doing? My youngest son was moving the conversation along on the need rather than debating the position. And so you can see what a strategy is um, like that to use and understand how underlying needs actually move people through a conversation versus positions that actually get us fighting against each other. Now later we're going to talk about this topic again when we get to stage four. Because again in stage four we see positions and interests coming up in terms of what we see in mediation. Now for the last part of our show, I have an interview with a former student of mine. And she is a mediator in the Superior Court, and I'm going to ask her a few questions to highlight some of the challenges that you and I face in mediation in the courts. We'll be right back. You are watching DHTV from California State University to Mingus Hills. So as I said, today I have a guest on the show to help us understand more about what it's like to mediate in the superior court system. So welcome to the show, Irene. I have Irene Strange here uh, to interview about her experiences in the court. So what I want to do is talk to you about those experiences. And I want to start with um, understanding a little bit about your background. So what's your background in mediation? So my background is that I took a series of classes at Cal State Long Beach. And those allowed me to become mediation certified, um, earn a certificate in mediation. Mm -hmm. So it's called the DERPA. Um, and that gave me kind of the tools, like you talk about the toolbox on the mm -hmm. show, it gives you the tools um, so that when you go into court, you know how to go about the process of mediation, as well as uh, some of the background going into that. So you did the training and then you started mediating in court. Yes. And so what was that like? What were your first impressions of going to court? Mediating in court. Mm -hmm. um, so first off, when you go to court, um, it is a little intimidating um, at first because, you know, you're going to court. Normally when you go to court, you're in trouble. 
Um, but you <laughs> kind of, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, um, but once you get there and you realize that you're there to help people, mm -hmm. you're there to give people a chance to come up with a mutually beneficial solution to their issues um, where they can actually decide instead of having a decision made for them, mm -hmm. um, it definitely alleviates a lot of the pressure and refocuses that into just helping people communicate. Mm -hmm. so, so you met a lot of different mediators, um, so that probably expanded your training, I would imagine. What, what kinds of differences have you seen in terms of mediator styles? Oh, totally different, totally different. Um, I am more of an extrovert in general, um, and so talking and seeing and observing other mediators that have been doing it a lot longer than I have, that have um, more of uh, styles where they're really good at listening mm -hmm. and letting people talk and have a little bit more patience than I am normally in communication. I am very aware of keeping the progress going mm -hmm. um, and I've learned from some of the other mediators that you know in order to have an effective mediation you have to be open to allow it to go whichever way the disputants are willing to go. Now there are some people that mm -hmm. would take advantage of that, mm -hmm. um, but sometimes that's how it has to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes people don't come to agreements. Yeah, so, and there are some people that go straight in and don't, they do not want to give mediation a chance right. at all. Um, and they make that very clear. They basically will tell you like, I'm just here because the judge said that I should try. Um, and there's different tactics that you mm -hmm. can use to try and kind of unhinge that stubbornness mm -hmm. um, and that reluctance. Some people just think that it's a silly thing and some people when they are willing and they mm -hmm. actually do go through it, mm -hmm. they're extremely thankful and very, mm -hmm. sometimes even friendly with each other. In right, the which, is, which is a good thing. Now what I'm hearing you talk about is this idea of positional um, phrasing or thinking, yeah. which both kind of feed on each other, this idea that we would get so entrenched that mediation is good or bad that yeah. we would maybe um, convince ourselves regarding that. I find those a mediator that it's, it's usually the people who don't understand mediation who have that opinion. Um, yeah. And they say, we had a, a case the other day, which I told you about, I think, before the show started, which was um, the, the party said they wanted to win in mediation. So they would be happy to do mediation as long as they won, which is exactly what mediation isn't. Yeah. So um, we found that to be kind of an interesting uh, misunderstanding on the part of the disputant in terms of that. Yeah, I've had similar experiences with that too, where um, they kind of fight towards the final agreement where I had two disputants. Um, they were really close. They were $100 apart from mm -hmm. half and half, actually half and half, because some people say half and half and it doesn't mean half and half. Yeah, we haven't gotten to that <laughs> yet, but that's true, yeah. that's right. You'll see, yeah. Um, but yeah, so they were $100 apart and the dispute literally said, the reason why I need $100 more is so I can sleep at night so that I can win. <laughs> yeah. So it yeah. happens yeah. and it's an ego thing, but yeah. So we have to manage all of that. Now, what would you say you've learned about our legal system as a mediator in our, in our superior courts? Mm. Um, well, one, that every court is different. Mm -hmm. um, also that I think a lot of people um, might not take it as seriously until they get there. You know, mm. people I feel like are very open to threatening, I'm gonna sue you, things like that, mm -hmm. and then they get there and it's a, a totally different thing. You're actually in the legal system. Mm -hmm. You are at court. You know, if you speak out a term too much, you could end up handcuffed. Right. Um, and on top of that, that um, you know, there's many different phases of court, and they're all very different. Small claims, mm -hmm. civil harassment, and lawful detainer. Mm -hmm. They're very different. Even yeah. though you might see the same judge, right. it's a totally different tone mm -hmm. that you're dealing with. Um, and you know. Also in regards to mediation, um, I feel really, I always feel really happy when we are able to come to agreements and help disputants mm -hmm. um, because I feel like it takes a little bit of a load off the judge yeah. and, and the clerk as well um, because some sometimes they have a lot of cases to go through and I wonder if they would really have enough time yeah, I doubt that because, you know, in Orange County last year, 1,700 cases were ended in mediated agreements. Wow. And so that's a lot of cases to hear in trial. I'm not sure we would uh, 
be in a good place today, like you said. Yeah. It'd be like overloading the system. Yeah. Um, so that's a, that's an interesting thing to think about that whole workload of the legal system and how there's a trial operating at the same time as mediation and all these different um, moving parts that are trying to get people to a better place. Yeah. Um, the position of our judges often, I find, and I'm sure you found, is that they want parties to agree because then they can get rid of their actual dispute, which is yeah. you know helpful. We can move forward sometimes. So um, let me ask you this now, as, um, as you have done a little bit of coaching of our, our new mediators, um, what do you think is the hardest part for new mediators to learn? I th so I'm going to give my answer based on personal, but also a little bit of what I've seen. Um, definitely storytelling, um, mm. stage two, is, was the most difficult to adjust to. Hmm. Because as a comm major, you're so used to being able to pick up where people are emotionally, mm -hmm. but also, you know, you can pick up key words and where they want the conversation to go. Um, so, you know, it's very easy to problem solve and guide a conversation mm -hmm. versus in mediation, you're not necessarily guiding or especially not suggesting right. in the conversation. So it's trying to recalibrate and adjust your communication style and how you're used to asking questions in a way where you're facilitating a conversation because these are people that are can't communicate mm -hmm. or having a really hard time communicating. Or have failed or whatever. Yeah. yeah, so you can't really insert yourself between that conversation that needs to go on you need to find a way to facilitate that. And that starts in storytelling mm -hmm. um, and you know, issue identification and kind of sifting through everything. Once you get through mm -hmm. that, everything else will come. <laughs> now, I don't know if everybody <laughs> agrees with that. I think sometimes people say stage four is a little harder too. It, and um, it, it can be. I think it depends Yeah, I mean, too. I'm not saying we have to pick, but. Yeah, yeah, but, and it depends too. I feel like, you know, if you were in family court, civil harassment, mm -hmm. those all would change. Um, but sometimes I find the most difficult is getting two people to sit down mm -hmm. and just talk. Right. And agree this is the issue. Right. Or these two issues are actually mm -hmm. why we're here. Right. Because a lot of times they're discovering it too. Right. Yeah, they discover it in the interaction, which is kind of interesting. Um, I find that kind of interesting, and maybe that's reflective of what you said too, um, having both of us have a background in communication. We have thought often who, what the main points are. Mm -hmm. That's how we think as communication professionals. Yeah. And so we're um, surprised sometimes when we encounter people who haven't figured those main ideas yeah. out, right? Because it, it demonstrates maybe this lack of introspection or this lack of understanding and we're a little bit surprised because it's not how we roll. Yeah. And, oh, yeah, no. <laughs> right? But the thing that's interesting is the task that you described the mediator has in, in terms of getting through that and um, helping them uh, do that work that they failed to do prior to the session. Yeah. Okay, one last question. Okay. What advice would you give a, another mediator or a new mediator? Mm. Um, to be kind to yourself. Um, mm. There's a big learning curve with this process, especially if you have a lot of academic calm background. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, be kind to yourself in that you will be able to readjust and recalibrate the communication style that's required for mediation mm -hmm. and you'll do it really well. And you will learn fast, um, even though it'll seem really hard sometimes mm -hmm. and that you can't think of the right questions or you can't think of the right words to say, right. you will and you'll get there and it'll be great and you'll learn a lot continuously. Mm -hmm. So the advice is to, to suspend with judgment yeah. as you're learning those essential skills. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Yeah. And so then it's like the challenge for maybe all of us learning a new skill mm -hmm. is to not shame ourselves in the process, right? We don't yeah. do that when we learn to ride a bike. We don't say, wow, you fell off the bike. That was horrible, <laughs> you know, when we're five. Yeah. Um, or learning any other skill. Um, it's the challenge, maybe our human challenge is this notion that we have to... Um, I don't know, get in a headspace that has such openness that yeah. we can maybe, um, I don't know, scrape our knee a little bit and then maybe learn something in the process. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. Yeah, and thank you. Um, we really appreciate your insights. And we know that they'll be very helpful for anyone watching the show who's interested in mediation or growing in terms of their skills. So, thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
So as we close out today's show, I just want to um, reiterate that we've talked about five different topics related to storytelling and issue identification. This idea that you and I can, through our communication skills, start to understand what the key issues are. So as we close, I'm going to um, ask you to think about your skills in terms of storytelling and challenge yourself to today go right out to people that you interact with and try to practice those neutral phrasings. Try to practice paraphrasing. Try to practice the different things we talked about in today's show so that you can improve your communication skills. And as always, we sign off the show with this. I'm Dr. Pamela Kreiser, wishing you peace. Mm -hmm.